My name is Phil Parazio, and I'm a urologic oncologist, a surgeon. Like many of you, I absolutely love what I do, and I would not choose another profession. But I have struggled with professional identity, practice efficiency, and wellness over the years. Operate with Zen is a podcast designed to explore a mindful approach to surgery and to being a surgeon. By discussing these struggles and mindful solutions, I hope together we can create a community of strong and healthy surgeons. Enjoy. Welcome to this episode of Operate with Zen. Today, I have the wonderful pleasure of being joined by Dr. Netta Gould. Netta, introduce yourself to the audience. Sure. Thanks for having me, Phil. Um, I am a clinical psychologist on the faculty in the Department of Psychiatry at the Hopkins School of Medicine, and I um, direct a mindfulness program there. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about the mindfulness program. And that's how we initially started uh, interacting, or at least I became aware of you. While I was at Hopkins, we never, we never formally interacted. Mm -hmm. Very aware of your work. So tell us about the program and, and how it interfaced with uh, with the with the faculty and staff at Hopkins. Yeah, sure. So, so the program kind of has two arms. One is um, running mindfulness courses and um, lectures to, uh, for patients, um, and those are patients that are referred from kind of all different areas within the hospital. Some of my own patients who have depression, anxiety, and then the second component is working with faculty and staff and bringing mindfulness in various forms, formal courses, lectures, drop-in meditations to that group of individuals. And it kind of, um, it started with the patients and I started running these groups for patients. I eventually got certified in um, a course called Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction, which I, I can talk more about. Um, and then as I was recruiting for these courses for the patients, the faculty and staff said, oh, well, do you have something like this for us? And, and uh, I thought, oh, no, but it would be really fun to try. So just on my own time for fun, I, I kind of started a course and collected some preliminary data. And it, um, you know, there were some really um, profound changes after this eight week course. And I think I was surprised by it, but so were the members. And so I took that information to um, kind of our Office of Faculty Development, and they really were um, interested given kind of the, the rates of stress and burnout at our institution as well as others across the country. And so that's kind of where it started. And I just kind of ran with it and never looked back. <laughs> well, that's amazing. So tell us, you know, when you start these classes, just let's start with some basics of mindfulness. How do you describe mindfulness to your, mm -hmm. to your classes and to your, your yeah, patients? Yeah. I think that's a really important, um, uh, part, a place to begin, that people understand what we're doing. I think a lot of people are turned off, especially physicians are, you know, that are fo so focused on these hard sciences are really turned off by this idea of mindfulness. They think it's this kind of fluffy concept. And really, it's just bringing attention to the present. It's noticing what's happening within us um, on a physical level, on an emotional level, noticing what's going on around us. And trying to foster a particular kind of attitude of being open and accepting to what's here as opposed to resisting it. And so having an attitude of non-judgment um, re related to our experiences. Yeah, I think it's incredible. I mean, I, I always think of it the same way. And as you know, I'm a big advocate for mindfulness and mm -hmm. I talk to surgeons about it all the time. And you're right, it, it's really hard to break down these barriers and the biases we have about kind of soft science. And first of all, we'll get there, but this is not soft science. I mean, there's really I good data and hard science here. Absolutely. The of this. Absolutely. Yeah, this is this is hard science. And I think where I really am able to get kind of the... Um, get some people who might be a little resistant to buy into it is when I start telling them about the changes in the brain and pulling up the, the research. And so I always do that in um, all of my courses, but in particular with um, some of the scientists and physicians so that they can say, oh yeah, there is a lot of research supporting this. Yeah, I agree with you. And so, you know, 
to your point, the things I always bring up, you know, being mindful, it's an intentional process. You can't just let this happen, although you, mm -hmm. you can to some degree, but it, mm -hmm. you have to be, you know, kind of intentional about it. As you said, being in the moment and being non-judgmental, that open mindedness, I think are the, the core, mm -hmm. you know, kind of components that people need to realize. It's not just a walk in the park. You have to be a little thoughtful about what you're doing, but let's, I would love to jump right into the data. This is, yeah. a, this is potentially a skeptical audience. We're going to have a bunch <laughs> sure. of surgeons and medical people listening. Uh -huh. Let's, if you don't mind, let's talk about some of the data or some of the things you rely on when you're talking to people about why mindfulness works and how it works. Absolutely. So, so, you know, we can start in, in so many areas. I can, you know, since I brought up the brain, let's talk a little bit about that. So, um, you know, decades ago, people started researching the brains of individuals who are long-term meditators, such as monks or nuns, and then comparing that to normal controls. And, um, you know, this was work done by a group, um, Richie Davidson's group, and it's fascinating research. Um, and basically what it shows, and this may not be surprising, but is that the brains of monks and long-term meditators are different than our brains. And, um, you know, most of us aren't going to go and uh, become long-term kind of, we're not going to leave our jobs and, and join a Buddhist monastery. But what more recent research has shown is that even after an eight-week mindfulness-based stress reduction course or um, eight weeks of regular practice, we begin to see some of these same changes as, as long-term meditators show in their brains. And what are those changes? Well, we see increased activity in the prefrontal cortex. And that's, of course, kind of the wise part of, the bra of our brains, the part of the brain that makes us smarter than every other animal on the planet and allows us to reason and have high order thinking and executive functioning skills. So we see increased activity here, sometimes increased volume. And then we see kind of decreased activity in the parts, kind of more primitive reactive parts of the brain, the limbic system, the amygdala. Um, we see that you know, that that region of the brain is less, um, there's less activity when confronted with stimuli, kind of when we're anxious, we're able to, with mindfulness practices, turn that region of the brain off more readily. And this really coincides with what we see behaviorally following these courses. So we see that people are calmer, they're less reactive, they um, see options when it comes to problem solving. And so um, I think that's really kind of important that it's it's not just we see the brain changes but we see the correlating behaviors and then you know more specific to physicians and um, and surgeons we see improvements in overall wellness and well-being we see increased happiness um, decreases in depression anxiety uh, increases in attention um, and like improvements in kind of attention and cognitive performance, and then decreases in burnout and stress. So um, I think the you know the research is you know amazingly strong in terms of the positive impacts. I've also witnessed this myself and collected data myself in um, the faculty and staff population. I've seen decreases in you know significant decreases in, in burnout and stress, increases in kind of mindfulness and ability to be engaged in work. And just from a personal experience, I also just found it life-changing. And that's kind of what really made me turn towards it and start to incorporate it into my work life. Yeah, I want to ask you a little bit about your your personal story, but before we get there, just to kind of highlight or, or summarize kind of the the scientific part of this, mm -hmm. is, you know, in a lot of these, I wouldn't even say psychological constructs. I mean, there's data once again proving this. A lot of anxiety, depression, a lot of our difficulties are associated with overactive limbic system, mm -hmm. and my, what mindfulness does in its in its simplest form as a simple surgeon is it allows us to be aware of when our mind and mm -hmm. our brain are, are being overactive, mm -hmm. take recognition of that. We can't always control it, but we definitely can't control it if we don't know what's going on. It That's gives right. us the ability to understand that and kind of take a little bit of control of that normal primitive part of our brain and use, as you said, the higher order functions to kind of mm -hmm. keep things at a, a safer, um, kind of more 
you know, balanced uh, approach. Does that make sense? Is that, that uh, yeah, totally. And so what we call what you were describing is autopilot, um, which is kind of the opposite of being mindful when the mind is going and we're not even aware, you know, we're driving home and we don't even know how we got home. Um, and that, you know, we, we, go into that autopilot mode when we feel comfortable with what we're doing. Um, and there are problems with being in that kind of state of mind all the time. Um, we get caught up in, in, in kind of the currents of our distress. And especially if we're distressed, we the brain focuses on that and latches onto it. And so um, we're worrying about the future. We're worrying about the past and and we're not happy when we're in in those states of mind yeah i think you're absolutely right and, and it's such a refreshing thing to hear from another kind of provider mm -hmm. um that that we can get in autopilot but we're not uh we don't have to fall victim to it that's right, right. exactly exactly there is a way out i think what you're alluding to is that it it requires practice and the first step is to just recognize that we're in that state of mind that oh my gosh I'm caught up in thoughts and I'm you know sitting here trying to do a surgery or watch a movie or whatever the situation is yeah and, and I'm sure we'll get there but uh, you know meditation and mindfulness practices are not easy but that's the mm -hmm. whole that's mm -hmm. the whole point of it mm -hmm. but if you don't mind tell us a little bit of your personal story how did you get involved in yeah. mindfulness what's your mindful mindfulness practice now and what's it evolved from yeah sure um, yeah, so it's a, it's, um, it's an interesting kind of pathway. So for, for me, I had heard of this thing called mindfulness, but, you know, never practiced it, never delved into it. And then what happened was when I was a postdoc at Hopkins, I was on the burn unit, I was working on the burn unit, and we had a research protocol. And this research protocol was looking at, um, bringing cognitive behavioral therapy and mindfulness practices to burn patients who had post-traumatic stress disorder. And so that was kind of my first introduction to what this mindfulness practice was. And we would teach some of the patients to um, kind of center themselves and, and, uh, and reground themselves when they get caught up in some of the traumatic reminders or, or uh, traumatic stories. And so, um, as part of that, I went and took this mindfulness-based stress reduction course. And this course is an internationally offered course developed by John Kabat-Zinn, if, if people haven't heard of it. And it, it's uh, an eight-week course, and we meet once a week for two and a half hours and then a full-day silent retreat. Yeah, I see you holding yeah. up that book. Yeah. So, yeah. I love to hold up books for the audience and let yeah. them know. Mindfulness for Beginners by John Kabat-Zinn, if you're interested, yeah. great place to start. Absolutely. Yeah, I love that one. Um, and, and so basically, I took this course and it was, you know, I, the best way I can describe it is just it was life changing for me. I realized that I was never in the present moment. I mean, probably not even since childhood. I don't remember living in the present. I was always thinking, okay, well, I have to do this or, you know, oh, what if this happens? And I was always super prepared for every exam, for every potential life event or thinking about what went wrong and how I could do it differently. And, you know, I was incredibly productive, but it also made me incredibly kind of anxious. And I missed out, I feel like, on a lot of activities because even though I was engaged in, um, you know, I was involved in a lot of different things. I wasn't fully present. And it wasn't until I took this course that I realized, oh my gosh, like, wow, how unpresent I was, but also like how you can change that. Like you can literally change the way your brain functions, even if it's functioned a particular way your whole life. And so with that, so I was really diligent about, um, the home practices and really committed myself. You know, I didn't have children at that point. Um, and so I was, you know, meditate. I started with meditating, I think a minute a day, and then I built it up to an hour a day. And then I had children and I went back to a minute a day. <laughs> um, and now it kind of fluctuates. So some days it's, you know, um, a minute, a few times a day. And then some days it's, um, you know, I might, work up to 30 minutes. Um, in here and there, I've gone on some silent retreats, which are really challenging, but also really empowering. Um, but you know, it's like, it's a lot of 
it's a lot of time. And what I'm talking about, I'm sure a lot of people are like, well, I don't have time for that. And so there are alternatives, but this was kind of my pathway to this. I think that's incredible. And I think it's really important here. I mean, listen, you are a mindfulness expert and a minute a day is okay, right? Mm -hmm. Starting small, setting huge goals for yourself. I'm going to meditate half an hour a day. I'm going to meditate mm -hmm. an hour a day, especially as busy clinicians with families and other things going on in our lives. You're setting yourself up for failure. And mm -hmm. um, I started the same way, a, a minute or two a day. I think at my best, I'm at 20 minutes now, but mm -hmm. you know, listen, if I hit seven or eight minutes, um, that makes me, uh, I'm, I'm pleased with myself because it's not easy no. and there you'll, there you'll experience benefits even in those short amount of times. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think the benefits are different, but there, there, there are lots of benefits, even, you know, that one minute could shift everything you know if you're in a minute where you're having a tense interaction with somebody that minute or for that matter one breath of one mindful breath can shift what you say can shift what you do um you know it pulls us out of that it that um impulsive uh, reaction and so all of it counts. Um, it's just that, yes, if you meditate a half hour a day, you're going to feel a, kind of probably a greater sense of calm for greater periods of time, but, you know, it, it all matters. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, that's one of the things I like to stress uh, specifically to surgeons. And while this podcast is directed at surgeons, it's for all kinds of busy mm -hmm. professionals, but rough day, whether it's clinic or OR, stepping away for a minute and kind of recentering yourself can have huge impacts on the next 10 minutes, on the next hour mm -hmm. and prevent you from doing something that you may regret. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I'm clearly not a surgeon, but I've worked with enough surgeons. I've been in the OR as an observer, you know, when, when I was on the burn unit and it's, you know, a chaotic, stressful place. Um, and you're absolutely right. So not only before you go in, at, you know, after you come out, but during, there, there are opportunities where you can use mindfulness when things go wrong, when you want to, you know, snap at the people around you because something's gone wrong. Those are all opportunities where mindfulness can be helpful and help us shift and have a different, you know, we, we say response as opposed to a reaction. That's a great way. And, you know, the 20 minutes of practice on Saturday when you have time may actually help you in those two breaths that you get in the mm -hmm. middle of a, of a heated exchange and, and it mm -hmm. all kind of adds up. Absolutely. I, and I think like it's important to distinguish. I think people think of mindfulness often as just meditation. So I have to sit in, you know, lotus position and bring attention to my breath. And, and um, first of all, you don't have to sit in lotus position, but, um, but, you know, there is the mindfulness meditation component where you are sitting in a chair, for example, or on a cushion, uh, and you just bring attention to some aspect of the present moment. And later today, um, you know, I can guide people through a your listeners through a, a meditation so they get a sense of that if they've never done this. Um, but then an equally important part is bringing mindfulness to whatever you're involved in. So mindfulness of daily activities. So when you're taking a shower to notice that you're taking a shower as opposed to planning, you know, your day. Um, when you are um, in the OR to kind of be fully in the OR. And it's it's not that it's so black and white that of course your mind is going to wander, but then we begin to, with practice, notice those wandering minds. And both of these components are really important to build that muscle of mindfulness. So you, you know, you can think of it as aerobic and anaerobic exercise. You know, you, you need both to be really in, in shape. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And when I talk to surgeons about mindfulness, I always say the OR is the most mindful place in the world or can be when, mm -hmm. when it's at its best, everybody is singularly focused on that one patient and the one problem in the moment and mm -hmm. nothing else matters. Right. So all surgeons are mindful. It's just, they're not necessarily aware of what they're doing and they're missing that intentional component. Yeah. So what I work with people is bringing the intentional purposeful component to that. Mm -hmm. And I think it translates nicely into the rest of our lives. Once you can kind of draw that link. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, and I think it's wonderful to hear that 
surgeons can be so mindful, you know, that's what you want to hear. Um, and yet they're human too, right? And so with the stresses of life, like the brain can get caught up in the stresses with burnout, you know, our, our mind starts to not function at the capacity that we want it to function. And so, so I think that, um, that many people and including surgeons are already have kind of this reservoir of mindfulness and we're just honing it and beginning to add to it or helping to have the tools when life doesn't go exactly as planned. Yeah. I want to get to burnout in a second, but I just want to go back to, you know, one other thing I think is really um, appropriate for our audience that you brought up and you kind of talked of the anxiety of academics, right? Mm -hmm. Where we're all high performers and we've worked really well, whether it was through school or our training, but as you said, a lot of us were focused on what's the next step. So even though you're studying mm -hmm. for this test and we see it with our med students, right? You're studying for step one, but you're thinking about step two, <laughs> right. right? Or you're on your surgery clerkship and you're mm -hmm. thinking about neuro, you know, neurology, because that's really what you want right. to do. And what can I get out of this to help me with that? And where you can get a lot more out of kind of being in the moment. And, and you definitely need foresight. You need to plan and you need to think things forward and think things through. You can't be, you know, 100% in the moment all of the time or you'd be a monk, right? Mm -hmm, but right. Um, so we don't all have that freedom, but we can be more intentional and present. And as I became more um, intentionally mindful, I became aware of some of the parts of my life where I was unintentionally being mindful and a lot of it came down to um, kind of athletics for me. And you talked about different ways mm -hmm. we can meditate or, or mm -hmm. be um, mindful. And active meditation is certainly a way to do this. And I remember when I was in med school, I ran the New York City Marathon twice with a good friend of mine. Wow. And so we would go on these long runs on Saturday morning as we would train. In the first half an hour, 45 minutes, we're talking to each other, catching up on this, people watching. And then all of a sudden you hit that hour mark a little bit longer. And we're both just kind of silent. And I just remember these like kind of beautiful spaces mm. where you just were taking in New York City, taking in Central Park without really being thoughtful about what else was going yeah. on and able to do it. And it took time to get there. It wasn't easy. Yeah. But in retrospect, that's the same kind of sensation and feeling I get in a, in a mindfulness practice now. Mm -hmm. And similarly, I think we can, you also experience in the operating room, whether it's the heat of a good case or a tough case, you can get into that same incredibly present moment where nothing else matters. Mm -hmm. And I didn't become aware of that and why I enjoyed surgery and athletics and all these things so much until I started being a little more intentional with mindfulness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and um, you know, I think about, you know, what you describe kind of in in kind of psychology terms, we often talk about this flow state where you're like fully immersed in something and runners experience it, everyone can experience it when you're really engaged. Um, and then I, you know, I it, as you were speaking, I was thinking about what pulls you out of thoughts, right? It's, it's, it's our ability to think and our ability to think about negative things. Like I remember, you know, you're talking about the marathon. I did a triathlon, the first triathlon, I did like a sprint triathlon. I um, remember getting in the water and I'd never, I don't even think I'd have, I'd never done like an open water swim like like that and if, if anyone's not done one all of a sudden you're in the water and people are kicking you in the face and it's splashing and I remember thinking I'm gonna drown and then I realized the water was only like two feet deep there and so that I could stand up and it would you know everything was okay but then I thought oh my gosh this swim seems really long and I distinctly remember thinking well all I have to focus on is, is this next stroke and I said that to myself for the duration of the the triathlon and it was so much more pleasant than oh my gosh am I going to make it through this oh my gosh am I going to drown oh my gosh you know this is going to be so hard and and so like I recognize that our thoughts whether we're you know doing a sport or or um surgery or you know whatever that how much our thoughts have an impact and one one thing that really has helped me that I share in all of my talks is to just kind of one come back to your senses and just kind of notice the thoughts that kind of pull us away but also just drop the story that you get caught up in and just come back to the facts of the situation uh, because the facts 
it doesn't mean the situation is always really blissful, but it means that we can have a situation that is stressful and then we tack on layers and layers of distress by adding these potential stories to it. And I'm a master at that. And so I really kind of use that tool to say, okay, all right, all right, what are the facts and what's the story? Let's just come back to the facts. I think that's a beautiful way to do it. I think we see that a lot in personal relationships too, right? How do you see with your significant other? Oh man, they reacted to me this way. That means this is going on or that's going on. Drop the story. Just right. what are the facts? Maybe somebody's just having a bad day. Go, you know, figure it out. Totally, totally. It applies to so much of life. And so I always, I make sure, even if it's not relevant to the talk, I still, I still share it because I feel like it's such an important tool. Yeah. Well, that's great. Well, um, let's get into the, the burnout a little bit. Tell us about how mindfulness can either help with or prevent or both with burnout, because it's one of the big one of the big issues now. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah. So I've been talking to a lot of people about burnout. And I think um, I guess to speak about it broadly, I think the issue one issue with burnout is that um people are often relayed this message that you're the problem, that you can't handle things. And so um, that's why you, you're burnt out. And I can't emphasize enough how um, unhelpful that line of thinking is. Um, that, you know, we work in, in places that are incredibly stressful and that aren't perfect in terms of, you know, everything. Um, and so, so I think that when we address burnout, you have to look at the, the institutional factors that need to be addressed and then personal factors. And, um, you know, you could meditate five hours a day, but if there are problems with the system, you're going to be unhappy and, and can still be burnt out. So I think that's kind of the, the first thing I'd like to say about burnout. Um, and so, so, so there are kind of systemic issues that need to be addressed, but talking about individual things, I think, I think mindfulness can be helpful as a preventative tool, um, but also can be helpful when we're experiencing burnout as well. And, and that's kind of what the science shows is that we can use mindfulness practices as a way to kind of build our reservoir um, in some way so that we don't become totally exhausted. Um, it helps us, um, you know, not be as emotionally reactive. We're, that emotional reactivity is, is draining. It, when we're also caught up in the future or the past, it's draining. Um, when we're burnt out, we sometimes don't sleep well or, um, you know, experience um, kind of uh, negative uh, physical ailments. And so all of those things deplete us. And I think that mindfulness is a way to replenish those uh, components in our life so that we're not so prone to, to exhaustion. And then when we do experience those things, mindfulness is kind of a way to um, help us uh, re gradually rebuild. I mean, ideally we prevent it, but it's not always possible. So we can just uh, address it in the moment. Yeah, I think it's an incredibly powerful message, and and you're not the first person on this podcast to say, listen, uh, you know, eighty percent of the burnout is systemic, but there's twenty mm -hmm. percent that we have control over, mm -hmm. and that that little bit makes a difference. And, and I'll tell you a little bit of my personal story. I mean, I had a I had a really, really, really bad burnout episode a few years ago that kind of started this mindfulness journey for me. Mm -hmm. And in retrospect, I realized I was just cycling through burnout through training and through other things, and being more mindful and engaging in a mindfulness practice has helped me realize when I'm starting to build up towards burnout and kind of intervene early yeah. to prevent the crash and to prevent the terrible things um, from happening. Yeah. And, um, you know, first, once again, by kind of acknowledging what's going on with myself and what's going on around me, but then being able to sit back and have some skill sets to, you know, be able to work through it. Mm -hmm, exactly. Yeah. And um, yeah, I, I can relate to that. I remember early on when I joined the faculty, I, I experienced what what was burnout, but I didn't know what it was. Um, and I think that's the other kind of kind of thing. Like people people come to me and, and they they're like, I don't know what's wrong. And often it is it is burnout, but burnout, you know, overlaps so much with depression and anxiety and um, other, you know, um, results in 
you know, people turning to drinking and other maladaptive coping mechanisms. Mechanism. So it's, it's, a, it's a complex phenomenon. Um, but yeah, I remember kind of experiencing it and it's, and it's tough because you just, um, I think people don't know where to begin to address it. And, and others will say, well, take a vacation or, you know, um, do X or Y or Z. And, and that sometimes can help, but we need kind of, I feel like longer term, more intensive interventions that are um, embedded into the culture of our institutions. Yeah, a, a lot of those strategies are just band-aids. As you said, they're not really addressing the underlying issue and it's just bound to happen again. Um, but I think mindfulness helps in, in what you said, giving you the reservoir, giving you the ability to deal with it, but also being able to step back and think about the systemic issues because you've now addressed yourself. And when you're just spinning and in, in the moment, in a bad way, in mm -hmm. the burnout moment, you have no ability to kind of assess the situation and think beyond the pain and the suffering you're in, in the moment. Totally. And, yeah. yeah. You're in survival mode, right? Exactly. Like every day you wake up and you just try to get through the day. Um, and yeah, it's not where we want our providers to be. Yeah. And then listen, I, I talk to, especially the trainees and, and listen, sometimes you're going to be in survival mode and we are even as faculty, mm -hmm. there are some days and some weeks, but the problem is when survival mode just stacks on survival mode, stacks on survival mode, and there's no respite, that's when burnout happens. And Ooh. so recognizing the survival mode and the feeling that comes along with it is, is really important. Mm -hmm. Right. So when we think about that fight or flight response, it's not designed to be turned on all the time, right? When an uh, animal um, is kind of uh, uh, threatened, when, you know, when there's a threat, it turns on, they react, you know, whether it's to run or, you know, flee, flee freeze, or um, fight, flee, or freeze. Um, and and then, then kind of it's over and done with. But, you know, so for us, if we keep pushing that button and turning it on, it, it kind of really wears, it leads to kind of psychological and physical wear and tear. Benetta, if you don't mind, t talk us a little bit about kind of nuts and bolts of what an eight week program would be like, mm -hmm. just so people yeah. understand where they would start and where they would finish, you know, not necessarily... Yeah. Yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. So that that eight week kind of the mindfulness based stress reduction or MBSR course is perhaps the most well researched and available program. And it's um, and so it's eight weeks where we meet once a week for two and a half hours in a group setting. Um, during that time, um, we gradually build kind of the length and um, variation in different mindfulness practices. And, um, and in addition, learn ways to bring mindfulness to daily life. And then there's some group discussion, not group psychotherapy per se, but group discussion about the practices, whether in session or outside of session. And then there, um, there's gentle yoga or stretching, and then uh, there's recommended home practice. And the recommended home practice is kind of guided meditation. So you're provided you know, links to guided, guided audio that correspond to the course. And then uh, after kind of the sixth week, there's a... Um, a full day silent retreat where the participants are in silence, but the teacher is not. So you're just guiding the individuals through and just kind of an opportunity to go a little bit deeper and see what it's like to be with ourselves essentially. Um, and so it, it's, uh, it's time consuming. Um, I think that if, if your schedule allows you to take this course, it's amazing and, and just really a great, um, introduction to these practices and the way to really set a, a strong foundation. Um, I, so I teach that course, but since, since the pandemic, I've been teaching it virtually and, and two and a half hours on the computer is a really long time for me, for others. So I've truncated it to like a modified version to um, one and a half hours for eight weeks and then a half day silent retreat. And so far that's been well received. I think um, it's not the same. It's, it's not the same kind of level of intensity and connection with group members, but it still, I think has a, a place and it's, it's been valuable. That's great. And tell us about your kind of personal experience. What are you seeing at the end of eight weeks? You know, what can people expect? You know, yeah, 
I think it depends on partly your attitude and commitment to the practices, but, um, but, you know, at some point, I feel like for many people, there's, a, there's a transition of um, a sense of increased calm of increased acceptance. Um, you know, I have, gosh, the number of stories I could tell you uh, about kind of the benefits people have experienced are just really um, profound and limitless. But I mean, for some, I, I'd say over and over, I do hear people saying it's life changing. Um, those people tend to be the ones who really commit to the practices, but everyone picks up something that they can take away that I feel like improves um, their well being. But even just that connection with other providers in a space where other people are saying, yeah, this is tough, um, can be can be powerful, even if they don't practice anything except what we teach in the course. I think that can be so powerful in and of itself because part of the burnout is just the sense of really feeling isolated and alone um, that just, you know, is so challenging. And so, so I think it's so helpful just to do that. Yeah. And, you know, we started off talking about kind of some of the science and hard science, and I think that's important for skeptics to get over the threshold. But it, there really is subjective benefits and it doesn't matter what your score is on necessarily a burnout score. If you feel better and you're performing better at work and you're sleeping better at night and you're kinder to your family and your patients and your coworkers, mm -hmm. then those are all benefits. Absolutely. And it's different for everybody, but I, I totally agree. Um, and, you know, I think that the, the nice thing about a course is that, um, is that, you feel a sense of accountability. I think one thing that's so hard for me and for all the, um, you know, individuals I speak to is to actually sit and do these practices because it's the first thing you can knock off your calendar or to-do list, right? Like, why am I going to sit and and um, bring attention to my breathing when I have when I could write like twenty notes in that period of time? And there's an instant reward and gratification to the latter, whereas with the former, you may you know, sometimes we feel worse before we feel better because mindfulness isn't, isn't relaxation. Mindfulness is turning towards our experiences. And sometimes these experiences are really challenging, but it turns out that if we can do that um, in kind of um, a, a repetitive kind of consistent kind of way, we build resilience to be with the discomfort because that pushing away of it and distracting ourselves only works for, for so long. And so this is an investment, but I think a really, a really valuable one. Yeah. And I think it's important to recognize that this is not easy. It's not always peaceful. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it can be actually incredibly distressful mm -hmm. because the thoughts come into your mind that you weren't planning on or mm -hmm. expecting and can really challenge you. And that's part of the process. And it's okay to recognize that it's not all going to be butterflies and yeah, you know, waterfalls. You know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that, yeah, that's to that's true. And, um, you know, I think, I think it's important for people to be prepared for that, um, that, you know, yes, you once, when you pause, anything is fair game, right? Anything like thoughts from when you were in kindergarten, um, you know, thoughts about a patient 10 years ago, anything's fair game. And, and we do need to have some psychological stability to be with these experiences. That's where a teacher can be helpful. That's where um, kind of speaking with someone who has some experience can be helpful to see if it's the right time for you to engage in it. And so I'm not saying that this is a panacea and every surgeon in the world should now go and meditate because um, no, for some people, it's not the right time and space. And, and so, um, so you do want to, you know, if you're severely depressed, if you're, you know, um, using substances regularly, regularly to kind of escape your situation. Um, if there's any psychosis, for example, you, you don't want to turn towards those experiences because you, there's just, they're just going to intensify. Um, so, you know, those are times when we want to seek other help first and then kind of consider the mindfulness practices. I think that's a really, really, really important point because there's a lot of people out there struggling mm -hmm. and, and struggling um, in, in really deep and, and dark ways. And there are people out there for you and, yeah. uh, and, you know, we're there to help. People are there to help. It's just hard to see who they are. And sometimes it's hard to gather up the, the courage or the insight to ask, but it's a really mm -hmm. important important step. Mm -hmm. And luckily, I think there are a lot of the major universities and schools of medicine have some 
mindfulness programs available. And I think that's, um, you know, looking into those resources, but not hesitating to look into the mental health resources. I think people think, you know, they're alone or that, um, you know, there's, there's still a stigma attached, but, you know, I could fill my practice instantly with faculty and staff who really need the help. It's just that some people don't have the time to seek out the help and some people feel anxious about, about doing it. But I, you know, I really encourage people to, to make use of, of these resources. Really strong message. I want to get back to one thing you said, you know, some, some people might want the instant gratification of writing 20 notes or being more productive. And there's a, mm -hmm. an author named Chris Bailey. I don't know if you've ever read any of Chris Bailey stuff, but he has a, it's an audio book now on, on uh, Audible, the Amazon platform. No, I haven't but it talks about the, the efficiency of being mindful. And he breaks it down in mm -hmm. a very formulaic way. And if I'm, rem if I'm remembering the formula correct, it's basically every, you know, every one minute of mindfulness translates into somewhere between seven and nine minutes of efficiency. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. while you may have 20 notes to write, you could power through them now, but giving yourself two, three, five minutes of meditation and then going at the notes may give you more efficiency and clarity. And I think it's a very, it's a, for some people, it's a very valid argument and, mm -hmm. and makes an important point that sometimes getting your mind away from the clinical or powering through when you need a little bit of a break or a change can sometimes help you be more efficient. Oh, totally. Yeah. I, I always kind of relay that message, but never kind of quantified it in that way. I love that, that that's quantified. Um, but yeah, it's so true that, um, you know, people say, I don't have time for mindfulness, but if you can practice it's that, you know, you get a return on your investment. You, um, you can, um, you're often more efficient. You know, sometimes you enjoy tasks more, even these mundane or stressful tasks, you actually enjoy them more because you're not so focused on finishing that task and moving to the next thing. Um, you know, I've had in my groups and even my own experience, people said, yeah, I took 30 minutes a day to meditate, but I was actually more productive on grant writing, for example. And that was my experience when I was meditating kind of consistently for long durations of time. Not only was I more productive with grant writing, I actually enjoyed it, which to me was like a total shock. Um, and, um, and so I think that, yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree that, that there is a it's an investment of your time and, uh, you know, give it a, give it a try and see what it's like. Yeah. I think there's some great analogies from kind of the, the monk livelihood too, right? They tend gardens and pull weeds and do sweep and do kind of mindless tasks. And in medicine, this is epic in signing prescriptions and sometimes mm -hmm. grant writing and papers and mm -hmm. such. But there's times to really enjoy it and use those as kind of mindful opportunities as well. Instead yeah. of struggling through the stress of having to finish these tasks, enjoying them for what they are, it's a time right. where you don't have to be so zoned in and right. you kind of enjoy the moment and do something less taxing. Right. Yeah. I see that in sometimes when I have groups or like retreats and stuff and, um, and, uh, you know, like people, I can see they're pulling out their phones and, you know, trying to multitask. And, I, and what I say is you're here anyway, like you have to write those notes anyway. So why not really just try to be present with it and see what that's like? Because we think that, okay, if I can do this and, you know, multitask that we're actually being really efficient, we're actually not. And, um, we're, what we're doing is just, making the current current situation more stressful <laughs> yeah i found my newest one is uh well not newest one i've been doing this for a while now when i travel instead of inefficiently getting work done on the plane i just binge watch my shows perfect i get it out of the way <laughs> and then when i land i don't want to binge watch anything else i'm ready to do work right. in a quiet hotel room or at a meeting or at a conference or whatever it may be and i could be totally into the stuff i need to do and I'm done with the binge watching and it's a way of just being more efficient. Not that that's necessarily being mindful, but it's, <laughs> you know, it's a way of being efficient. And if you're, a, if you're fully present with those shows and, and not kind of focused on, oh my gosh, I should be so doing something different, then, you know, perfect. <laughs> well, good. So if you don't mind, let's draw a little corollary, right? You, you said in the beginning, you, you do mindfulness for patients and for faculty and staff. How does it differ for the patients and, and faculty or staff? actually doesn't, which, you know, um, I've had faculty and staff come through my patient groups because they're, the, the course is exactly the same. Uh, of course, um, let me think. Um, yeah, I mean, I teach it the same way. Sometimes, of course, the, the, um, 
patients, you know, depending on where they're, where, what kind of group referred them might have more physical ailments or could be more psychologically distressed, but, um, but really they're quite similar. I give them different measures of, um, you know, pre and post measures sometimes, um, just because for the staff, I do focus a bit on um, burnout in addition to, to other things, but otherwise they're pretty similar. Well, that's good to hear. Um, so then I guess I can preempt the answer to the next question is, if you're thinking about this for surgeons specifically, you know, how would you think surgeons mm -hmm. can incorporate a mindfulness practice into their everyday yeah, yeah. So I, you know, if we go back to those uh, that kind of formal and informal, those those two two components of the mindfulness, I think formally, you know, start starting really small and just kind of doing experiments. Set, find a guided meditation, and there are millions out there. I think there are really some really popular apps. You know, I'm with them, but Calm, Headspace, In Timer, Insight Timer one but it all kind of meditations that that surgeons may relate to so i'm headspace or, or calm or um 10 percent happier but anyway finding a guided meditation and um starting really small one minute two minute five minutes maybe the second week building up to 10 if you if you feel like you can and you know um put it put it on your calendar make it part of your daily schedule um, and, you know, then check it off when you're, when you're done or delete it off your um, electronic calendar. Um, and then kind of informally, I'd say pick one, start by picking just one daily activity, you know, um, showering or brushing your teeth, walking to your car and do that one task without, you know, um, checking, hopefully you don't take your phone in the shower, but um, checking, <laughs> checking your phone um, without kind of making phone calls, you know, just be with that one task and see what that's like. And then, then you might extend that to something, something else. Oh, that's wonderful. I think that's great advice. I love the, the formal and the informal. I haven't thought of it like that, but I think it's a great way to build a little bit of mindfulness structure into your life. And, mm -hmm. and listen, one thing surgeons are good at is structure. Uh, exactly. Kind of right. Fo right. Following structure. We, we know when the OR starts, we know when it's supposed to end. And, yeah. and uh, structure, I think, is a great way of building that in. The other thing I'll just add to that is don't expect yourself to feel a particular way afterwards. You're not doing something wrong if you don't feel incredible. You, Like I said, you might initially not feel any different. You might initially feel a little worse because you're starting to think about things in a different way. It's almost like you have to open up the wound and clean it out before it starts to heal at, at times. Um, and, um, and the other thing is like, if also if your mind is just wandering and all over the place, that also doesn't mean you're not doing this right. Once you become aware of that, you're actually starting to be more mindful. And eventually with practice, you'll see that it settles a little bit. Yeah, I always like to joke. I'm pretty sure that Dalai Lama thinks he's bad at meditation too. I mean, it <laughs> I, is not I'm sure. easy. sure, yeah. One of my patients said this quote that really stuck with me. He said, thanks for this incredibly difficult, simple technique. Um, and I always kind of... Um, uh, reference that because I think it is really, it's one of the hardest things I've ever done because who wants to sit? Like, I'm like, I don't want to sit with my own thoughts. Like that's the last thing I want to do, but it's pretty incredible if you can kind of build that ability to do so. Yeah. Um, well, great. What, it, you know, one last question and then we'll move kind of towards summary. Um, you know, what do you say to the critics? You know, people can be really mm -hmm. critical of mm -hmm. mindfulness practices and, um, you know, I don't have enough time. This is, you know, this is the U.S. and I'm a busy surgeon or yeah. I'm busy whoever I may be. Yeah. You know, what do you say to the critics? Well, you know, if what you're doing is working for you, great. You don't need to do this. Um, if you're listening to this podcast, there's probably a part of you that is a little at least curious, maybe a little burnt out, you know open to this idea and just do an experiment. Like what have you got to lose? I think is what I'd say. Like, okay, you've got to lose five minutes out of your day, or maybe you, you are able to gain um, some kind of well-being um, or kind of fill your gas tank, but, you know, give it a try to give it a try for a week. And if you think this is the most ridiculous thing you've ever done, then, you know, 
you don't have to do it. No one's forcing you, but I think that it's worth just a try. Yeah. I, I think that's a great message. There's, um, I can't remember the name of the book right now. If I glance at my shelf, I might be able to find it, but you know, it talks about how in the, in Western culture, we say we're too busy. Our minds are, there's too much going on TV mm -hmm. and the world and the internet and our phones. We, there's no time for mindfulness. And in Eastern culture, they sit there and say, well, mindfulness is really only for the monks and the priests, right? And there's mm -hmm. always an excuse. And even, listen, there's there's no difference in our psychological stress than there was 2,000 or 3,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. Yes, technology is different. Our lives are different. But the psychological stress is the same, and people found time. Mm -hmm. um, and so it is, uh, it's up to us and, and the powers within us. And that, I think right. that's an important message. Right, yeah. So maybe, um, you know, 2,000 years ago, it was a saber-toothed tiger. Now it's like worrying about getting sued, <laughs> you know, like, like, um, there, the stress is, you know, the, the stressors may be different, but our response to them is the same. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Netta, what else do we need to know? What did we miss? What else do you want to share with the audience that we may not have covered today? Oh, gosh. Um, no, this was a great conversation. Um, Oh, gosh, nothing comes to mind. I feel like we covered a lot. Yeah, we did. And I, I enjoyed this conversation. I always say this. I mean, people are going to benefit from this. And I think that's the, the whole point of being here talking about these things. Yeah. Let me ask you then, are there any resources you like? Uh, I know I held mm -hmm. up John Kabat-Zinn's book. Yeah. But are there any resources you like for, for people who are interested in exploring a little bit more about yeah. this? Yeah. Yeah. So um, any book by John Kabat-Zinn, he's kind of one of the founding fathers. Um, you know, he, he wrote Full Catastrophe Living and it. Um, all of those books are on audio and that one kind of walks you through the mindfulness, the MBSR course, if you kind of want to learn more. I'd say um, between, if you had to read about mindfulness and practice mindfulness, I, I always say do the practices because you can read every book, but you're not going to derive the same benefit. Um, I um, sometimes I refer people if they want just some audio the ucla mindful awareness research center has some basic audio um for the i mentioned the calm app you know that or headspace they have um like small meditations that you can start with so maybe five minutes a day or 10 minutes a day and you can unlock a meditation each day and kind of that that feels kind of rewarding i think like okay and then it'll it'll give you some nice message like two day streak of mindfulness you're amazing and so always nice to uh, get that feedback so i would um start there but you can always just also google um, mindfulness, but going through some of these academic centers, I think you can filter out some of the um, meditations that you, may not resonate with you. I appreciate that. I think it's, I think it's great advice. And so before we summarize, I'll just tell the audience, you know, stay tuned. We're going to put a little bonus content after here. We're going to do a, a guided meditation mm -hmm. and we'll record that as a separate podcast and put that on as some bonus material for our listeners. But a really engaging conversation. I love talking with you today, Netta. You too, uh, Phil. Yeah, and just to kind of summarize, listen, we talked about what it means to be mindful, to be present, to do it intentionally and not judgmentally, to think about our physical and emotional uh, being, what's going on inside of us as well as what's going on around us. Trying to engage a more open and accepting mind frame. I think is, is really important. You talked us through some of the hard sciences and really kind of engaging the prefrontal cortex. What makes us different from other animals and beings on this planet is also what can allow us to escape these stresses and the, the older kind of structures and phenomenon of our, our limbic system, which is our fight or flight response. We talked about the anxiety of academics that a lot of us feel in, in medicine and surgery and how, why, why being more present and being in the moment and stop thinking about two weeks and two months and two years from now can help us really engage and be more productive and get more meaning out of what we're doing. We talked about burnout and I loved one of the analogies you gave when you were talking about your triathlons, just focusing on the next stroke. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's just about the next stroke. That's really mm -hmm. being present. Um, drop the story, stick to the facts, focus on the next stroke and you can kind of get through these things. And remember, mindfulness is not always a walk in the park. As you said, it's not always unicorns and waterfalls and butterflies. It can be really challenging. You may not feel incredible. In fact, you may feel worse up front, and that's okay. That's part of the, the process. But you can do this through both formal and, and informal aspects. Formally, 
try short guided meditations, put it on your calendar, check your box. We all love to check boxes. It's a mm -hmm. great short box <laughs> and you can start with one or two minutes. And then informally, I love this one. And this is one I don't do. And I'm going to do uh, today. I'm going to figure an informal task um, and make that a really mindful practice. I'm thinking uh, now that uh, I'm in Philadelphia and I'm commuting kind of without my family in, in town, my bike ride, I'm going to focus on mm -hmm. being really kind of present today. And, and in that moment, I often am because I'm worried about cars around me. Sure. So I'm focus pretty intently on what's yeah. going on, but I'll be a little more intentional about that as I ride home today. Great. Yeah. I, I uh, always have to remind myself to like, I chose so, sometimes I'll choose brushing my teeth and, and I'll, as soon as my toothbrush goes in, I'm like in the closet trying to pick the clothes for the next day and just once and I, have a, I think why am I doing that just sit on the bat edge of the bathtub and brush your teeth and it's initially a little boring but then it's like okay my teeth feel cleaner my my brain doesn't feel you know tired from this very simple task so it can be you know just these little things can make a difference. They can. And that's a great one, actually, because there's so much sensory information when you brush your teeth, mm -hmm. smell and taste mm -hmm. and the feeling of the toothbrush and the bristles and everything. That's yeah. actually a really good one, too. Mm -hmm. two, all right. And, two informal and showering. Ones on showering is a really good one. Uh, I, John Cavitz says this really funny thing of when you're in the shower, think of all the other people that are in the shower with you. And I think about that. I'm like, you're planning your first meeting. So everyone from that meeting is in there. And then you're thinking about what you're going to have for dinner. And so the family is in there and it gets pretty crowded. And so I always think of that. I'm like, I can just like feel the warm water and smell the shampoo. And oh my gosh, how like calming. That's wonderful. Well, now we got three things on my yeah, list, three but, I'm, but I'm there. <laughs> Netta, thank you so much. Real pleasure today. I know there's people who are really going to benefit from this conversation. I just want to thank you for your time. My pleasure, Phil. Thanks so much.